Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind-the-scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Hey, all Welcome to Inside the Firm. I am your main host, Al Gore. We're here with secondary, tertiary, just basically just a bystander. shows up. He's here. Lance Psycho. Yep. He's only, he's only here because he, he's the only one who knows how to run the editing software and then upload to SoundCloud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. How's it going, Al Gore? Uh, it's doing doing well, doing well. Better, uh, better week than last week? What do you think? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Last week, uh, all new You sleeping more? You sleeping better? I was until last night I started thinking about it again. Oh, this guy in his thinking. Yeah. It's going to uh, get him in trouble. Anyways, we have a special guest. He's driving to us right now as we speak. He's going to pop in any moment. It's going to be Evan Troxel. From Marquee Speak. So he, whenever he pops in, we will stop the co- podcast. Mid word. Mid, mid, yes. Mid what? word. Not even mid sentence. Mid word. That's how fast we'll be. Yep. Um, but first, Lance wants to talk about when should you let up? Yes. So uh, if, if you listen to last week's episode, which was, uh, we, we, which was Lance, and, Lance and Al Go to City Hall Part 3, um, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it because it's pertinent to today's conversation. Is so we went went and spoke at city hall, uh, at city council um, to defend our development project. Um, um, it's there's a new ordinance that's coming under <clears throat> under under uh, into existence here in Longmont, and um, the meeting went really well. We think we we th- we think we turned turned the cra- turned the uh, city council members and stuff like that, but. Um, the question is like, okay, so now you just sit back, you just sit back and go, yep, good to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question is, the answer is no. Right. So Alex has stayed on top of it and met with a few more, um, a few more people We're we're also continuing, you know, we're not like we, we've continued to watch the city council meetings and stuff like that. So obviously if you're dealing with, if you have your livelihood on the line, if you're trying to do any kind of development like this, you, you basically don't get to let up until, I think you sell the last unit. That's really where it's at. It's like you can't. It's it, this is a very long, long game. Yep. Um, like if it was a game of golf, I think it'd be like twenty-four holes. Yeah, and I keep trying to think of like not variables because um, they're planning for this new code change that will take an event, and they finally they finally said in September it's going to take it. It's going to go in. So plan for that for all these new projects. And uh, it makes sense because they've had the draft codes out for a couple months and all that talking about it. it, it it's hard just to convince them that you don't even have the draft out for us to see for this affordable housing. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to plan for. So I had a meeting with another city council member, and, and uh, now we're just going along the process. Just keep going, keep going. Keep going. We've, uh, then the, the, other, the other interesting part is there, there's a, we have a developer meeting coming up. And uh, where there's supposed to be over 70 different companies that go to this meeting, and we're going to meet with planning and zoning staff um, in a couple of weeks. And we've had since uh, since I sent out, you know, I think my, one of my afternoons a couple of weeks ago was just sending out an email to as many developers who are who are in the public queue as far as you know their their projects were being examined by the planning and zoning uh, department. So I said I sent out a mass email to all of them, and we've gotten emails that have been trickling in since then, even since the last city council meeting, where they, you know, they're very concerned, but they're so busy that you know it's taken them like a week or two to get back to me. Um, but they're going to be there uh, to meet to meet with us, to meet with planning and zoning, and um, speak up and, and just give their input on what's going to happen. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. W- one thing that was interesting that came from that meeting that I had with the council member was because we talked about when this should be implemented. And I said, well, you know, I don't think it should be in t- um, if people have been in this process for a while. And she goes, the issue with that is that people can claim and they'll drag their feet like a developer will be working on a project for two, three years. And it might not be the city's fault. It might be their fault where they're not replying or they said, hey, I bought this land four years ago for, you know, with this purpose. 
And the takeaway I got from that was one, you know, you could mitigate that by having an exclusion thing where you show that you've been making steady progress on it, you know, this whole time. So you haven't been doing any of that. And then two, um, people see through what you're doing because I know what she's talking about. And I've dealt with these developers where they're trying to do some sort of variance or trying to do something outside the rules and they're only doing it kind of for their own benefit and they're not giving the city much. Sometimes they do when the city doesn't see that, but sometimes just it, 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 it's just a greed grab. And what, what was disheartening about that? It was like, man, if, if you're doing that, or if we're doing that or whoever's doing that, you're ruining it for everyone because then they're making more rules. Like you might get away with your little, your little project. It's just so selfish and I see it being done. And it's like, you realize that like you're banking up all these things in planners minds, city council minds so that they have just a wall of justification for making all these rules, doing everything stringent. And then you will come and, you know, complain and all that. But not realizing that you contributed to it. Yeah, I had... Uh, so <clears throat> we put up... My wife beat me to the punch. She, she out-social media'd me. And, wow. And, and let me... And I know, I'm serious. And she let me know about it too. <laughs> she, she goes like, I even see you copied my post. So what she did is she took a screenshot of her speaking because she, she, she spoke after you and I. And, uh, and then she said... And then put a link to whatever, you know, her speech... It was beautifully done, but she got a lot of like, that was probably her most popular post in the last couple of months besides yeah. our family stuff. Yeah. So she had a couple of uh, people that she knew speak up and uh, like reply to her or whatever and say, oh yeah, I'm having all kinds of trouble, you know, with the county and like all these other building departments and everything like that. Um, and then what, what, it, uh, so her and I, she were, we, we were walking last night after supper and I go, and she goes, yeah, they probably, um. She goes, do you think, is there really anything you could do, Lance? And I go, well, here's the first thing. Because what they were asking for is like, oh, could Lance step in on our behalf and try to get our project approved? And I'm like, well, honey, here's the thing is when I have, when I see like uh, just the lay person, you know, the person who's not doing this every single day, like Alex or I, or our guys, I, 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 I wonder if their failure is part incompetence, right? Is just... This the f- and it's not even their fault because it's the first time they've like maybe because that's the thing is like you might only build an addition onto your house once in your life. You might only you and then like and then you shrink the pool even further like you, you a lot of people will never build a custom house, right? So so it's like so I told her that and she goes, Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe they just don't know what they're doing. I go, but honey, the bigger point is we do know what we're doing, and that's why it's a big deal if we complain about it, is that Geez, you have like literally experts at this, very proactive too. Go in and try to talk to them. You're, you're, again, you're running people, you're running drawings over, right, Al? Yeah. Physically. Physically. Al Gore, push ups, then running there. Every, then push ups after he gets there. Every 50 feet, I do <laughs> 50 push ups. The whole way there. <laughs> exactly. It's about 450 feet away. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's what I'm getting at is what Alex was getting at is. Having just having a bigger perspective and realizing that okay we might be the good guy developers at least in our heads that's what we are right but there's a there's a there's fifty other ones that that are that are not like us where they're just trying to weasel by and everything so trying to understand that yep. while you're to, while you're trying to convince people who are already against you is important. Well, what's crazy about that was um, in, in our meeting, one of the planners said like. He, you know, because he was getting hit on a lot of complaints and it was one of the head planners. He's like, well, this is actually good. This was at a city council meeting to hear all this to know how we're affecting it. Right. And then also when the council member was, was, uh, here, uh, um, they were com- upset about different rules and regulations. And, and here's the overall 10,000 foot perspective is that even the people that are implementing it, even the people that are making the rules, if they had to go through it, they wouldn't even like the rules. And they kind of realize that too. But again, you get this nuance of um, every time you make a law, it you first think, okay, is this to help out? And then you don't know the unintended consequences. And one everyone can relate to is um, remember how the corporations or people came out? And it was basically a, I think it was a pro video for Hillary Clinton. 
<laughs> like this is five, 10 years ago. Yeah. They're like, I'm a documentary. Like, why can't I make a video about a person in public who is a candidate? And they said, well, because um, it would be contributing to their political thing. Oh, sure. So then they made the rule like, okay, I guess corporations can, because, you know, it, he's a company or whatever, can can make that. So then it just opened the floodgates. Now every company can do it. And I'm sure when that person was thinking or when it was being reviewed, is being re- reviewed in the context of helping a Democrat. And now it's viewed in, this is a law that aids Republicans. Oh, exactly, yeah. They you don't know. take the unintended consequences, yeah. Yeah, so that's what's so difficult about it, and it's not... It's not an easy review process, and everything it comes down to rules and fighting. It's just, it's it's tricky. I don't I, I don't have a I don't have a solution, but I do have a solution. Uh-huh. My, uh-huh. <laughs> I, I do have a, a prescription, and that's, are you trying to do the right thing? So in our development, that's the only thing that's saving us is that when the commission re- reviewed it, they said you're trying to do the right thing. When we're talking to council members, we understand you're trying to do the right thing even though it might not fit in the way. So that's that's what you can do. And I think people will come to an understanding because I think people can see through to your motivations. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to skip ahead? Because I, I you led right into me doing the right thing. Oh, exactly. Oh, that's, that's, that's on purpose. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> so so I made a meme yesterday. <laughs> it was, if you could, uh, it was the lumber guy from office from the uh, office space uh, sh- show. And it was uh, if you could, if you could stop, if you could just follow the drawings and stop building illegally, that would be great. So <laughs> the reason I made it is because uh, we have a project, and one of our one of our guys went down to go re-verify some measurements, and he took a look at what was happening. By the way, it's only your projects. Coincidence? Coincidence? No, is it though? But name one of mine that they started building illegally before they got a permit. Well, we could count City View. They did get red flag there with no. adjusting the heights, but they did have a building permit. And they were built it. Yep. Yeah. And were... So, whatever. Extra. Anyway. What? Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, and it's always, it's always additions to a residential additions. Like, what are you doing? So, anyway, we had an associate go down. Oh, line. I've, I've had some. I've had someone called in. <laughs> they're talking about the foundation. And they're like, okay, we're going to change it. Like, well, it's already built. I was like, oh, <laughs> it has happened to me too. There you so. go. So I think maybe there you go. It happens to a lot of people. And I think a, I think a lot of architects, uh, builders, people, or even clients encounter this. So he went down to the site and said, and then called me and said, hey, it looks like there's like a three and four foot cantilever on two sides that we didn't plan for and they have it built. And I go, and I go, okay, well... Just continue what you're doing, and I did. I was so many things going on with the like me trying to do all these material takeoffs for the development. I didn't have time to even think about it. Got to driving on when on Wednesday, and then I was on the like after work, and I thought, hmm, shoot, we should. We've been down this road before. We should just. We should just. We should rescind at this point because that's what I've done before. Is I've just said I've actually given them a warning and said, hey. First, you know, the, so the phone call goes like this typically is, hey, we were out on site. We noticed a few, we just drove by. We noticed you have footings in the ground or, you know, you, we Whatever. noticed, we noticed you you're literally framing. have a, your frame because that's what they were framing, whatever it is. Do you have a building permit? Oh, well, they just said uh, they went and picked it up today. I'm like, well, if you could, if you could just stop building illegally before then, that would be great. Oh, look who's here. Evan, Evan Troxel. Evan, 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 mother Evan Troxel. Woo-woo. Hang on. All right, our buddy Evan Troxel is in. He's from Arky Speak. Uh, he's in vacation in Boulder, and we're in Longmont, so he popped up. Yep. How's vacation going? It's, uh, it's, I don't know, I'm about midstream, and uh, we've been doing a lot. Like, every day is packed. So I've already been up, you know, fly fishing this morning at 6 in Boulder Creek. So <laughs> it's just been a really busy, busy trip. I was down in Denver yesterday with uh, Angelo Morasco who's an architect and know him from, from the, from the Twitter and, and whatnot, but, um, gave me an awesome tour of Denver yesterday, uh, like an architectural tour. So that was super cool. And, uh, you know, just doing tons of stuff. We did Zion, we did Bryce, we did Capitol Reef. We've been up in the, the national park up there, the Rocky, Mas- Rocky. Rocky Mountain National Park. We've been in Boulder Creek every day fishing. And, and so, yeah, it's just been crazy. I, I love 
Utah. Yeah. It, it, and I get over there whenever I can. Yeah. Um, it, it's just amazing. And did you drive basically, what is that? Seven, it's just straight across. Yeah. Yeah. Where the landscape just yep. changes dramatically. And when you get into Colorado and that Canyon with the double decker freeway, it's amazing. It was super cool. Yeah. yeah. What, what's your favorite thing you saw in Denver? Um, or something unexpected. You know, I don't too. know the names of everything. So, of course, we just went to REI, which is like the flagship store, and it was crazy. That would be a cool type of project to do. Um, just, you know, adaptive reuse, amazing circulation. It's just neat materials. It's all rustic and everything. The one on Platt, right? Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's like their headquarters. That used to be our go to meeting. <laughs> like impromptu, okay. Well, not impromptu, but like we'd schedule meetings. They have a meeting room. Yeah, I yeah. Saw their that. Starbucks is right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was cool. And then so so we did the bike ride down the Cherry Creek bike path all the way down to Wash Park, and then I met up with Angelo, and he took us to all of the the new development that's going on. He lives in a um, in a what the heck's the name? It's escaping me, of course, right now. But. Um, Super architectural, mid-century, modern neighborhoods, you know, and then he lives in one, his studio's in one, he and his wife practice there. And then we just went all over the place. We drove all over the whole city. And we even went to the Shard, and we, like, afterward, I took my family, we walked down to the Shard, and um, it was super cool. We just saw tons of great stuff. Union Station was amazing, you know, with the... The Shard, you mean Liebskin? Yep. 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 Did you go... um I, there's so, when you said you know where they're building everything i'm like yeah. holy cow they're it's building everywhere. everything it's everywhere. everywhere there's like 40 cranes down there yeah it's, yeah it's ridiculous um and then even by the stadium if you keep going west into those neighborhoods just that's where we have a lot of stuff too oh, neat. so it's just crazy it is i can't believe how many people are doing construction here yeah. so. it, you're a california guy yep yep what city claremont claremont what's your it's, it's kind of like 30 miles 25 miles east of la Okay, yeah. but LA is pretty big. So are you? Oh, yeah. Is it still? We're LA of, County. Yep, it's still all connected. It is. What's your take on the Colorado vibe versus California vibe versus? There's so, so many so California. The city over is here. way different. I mean, I really enjoyed the city here. I think that you guys have some amazing infrastructure. The in, the the way that the streams and the rivers and the the amusement park and everything just kind of like gets all tangled up in the middle is awesome and i think that that really is a neat vibe it's kind of outdoorsy still but it still feels like a city Uh, whereas la is nothing like that at all um so it's and then and then like new york i was just in new york a couple weeks ago and new york is just super different way more dense way more traffic like here i could actually ride a bike and, and feel safe you know so not that i wouldn't necessarily in new york but those it's questionable. Have it's just different. It's just way different. So I thought the city was amazing. I was really blown away. Awesome. It and then cool. you're in Boulder, which is nice. It, it, it's smaller, but yet it's packed because it's only 100,000 people, but 300 come into work. So, Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I've experienced the traffic. I was surprised by how much traffic there is up here. Like, even just coming in over the 70 to get into, like, the Denver area, we... we like it was killing cars, right? There was cars pulled over, overheated all over the place because they're going up the steep grades up over the passes yep. and, and just sitting in bumper to bumper nonstop. Like everyone's just sitting there. It was crazy. I think a lot more people than you, than anyone thinks are waiting for Elon Musk to actually figure out the tunnel systems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The boring company. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Um, so tell us about your job, your work, and you were, either promoted or took over a role in yep. BIM. What does that mean and what are you doing and looking at? So it's a role that didn't exist before. It's something I've talked about this on our podcast before is, uh, is designing your future, designing your path and not waiting for someone else to hand it to you. So I saw a need and I think this is just good advice for anybody who's in the architectural industry. There's tons of jobs that didn't exist three or five years ago. And when I teach my class at Cal Poly Pomona in the winters, it's, it's an emerging technology class, and it's all about jobs that didn't exist. It's all based on technology three to five years ago. So if you're interested in something that is future thinking, especially in a firm like ours that was 78 years old, started in 1940. How many people? We have almost 350 people, I would say. So it's a, it's a large firm. We do, we do public work stuff. We do healthcare, higher ed, K-12, and civic and justice work. Um, basically there was a need for us to go to dive deep. I mean, we've been doing BIM for since what, 2009 or something, you know, Revit's been around for 17 years. So it's like, what's coming next? Who has a vision about where technology is going 
in the architecture industry. And there's lots of firms who are doing this all the time, so it's nothing new. But for our firm, it, it is kind of it's ne- necessary to forge a path forward with a vision for where technology can take us and not be constantly reacting to where it is or where it has been and because it's never going back there. I mean, that's an important distinction to make about architects who like to hang on to the past. You know, we still talk about, you know, we, we still have architects who work in our firm who still want to draw by hand and they wish long for the days we could go back to that. But the truth of the matter is it's never going to happen, right? So as far as BIM goes and design technology, so Rhino, Grasshopper, Dynamo, Revit, and the way that these things talk to each other, it's incredibly important for a firm of our size to get a grasp on how to l- gain all the efficiencies we can in those and also use those tools to raise our level of design and what we can put out there. Uh, so that's kind of where my role comes in and the, what I proposed. And, and it took a while, but we finally got it going, and, and that's where I'm at now. So, yeah, I've shifted slightly from being a, an architect designer on higher ed projects to becoming the director of our digital practice. Yeah. One cool thing I saw um, that I bet you your firm is exploring and doing, but I saw HOK do, mm-hmm. is uh, they made up their own script for, I think it was designing skyscrapers mm-hmm. or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they're, and when I looked at it, it looked cool and I understood what they were doing. I just can't tell you. I can't remember what it was. Sure. But it was a stark contrast from what you'd see 5, 10, 15 years ago right. where architecture firms said they were doing research. Right. And their research, when you looked at it, like, oh, you made a cool, funky thing. Like form and finding kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And now with BIM and all these technologies and even going into the 3D world and yeah. you know 3D printing and all that, I think architects can now actually do the research that is actually providing something new, that's actually making something new yeah. that they can control rather than just, you know importing it and letting other people drive well it's 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 using a computer for what it's good for so there's there's ways for us to use technology to run through design iterations faster than anybody personally could do so when i could come up with maybe three on my own the computer can do untold numbers of concepts and and many of those would be crap right but there might be some really good ones to take from and start with so when you're basing your design on environmental things, you know, you've got sun angles, you've got heating loads, you've got cooling loads, you've got wind loads. When you can bake that stuff into the parameters and the algorithms that help define those things, that creates a great starting point for a designer, for somebody who is creative to come up with neat concepts. So you're basically letting the computer do the stuff that mentally, cognitively, would be really difficult for us and then use that as a starting point to, to jump off with the creativity side. So uh, this technology uh, talk kind of gets me thinking about what everybody's been thinking about is 3D building or 3D printing 3D, buildings. Yeah. Um, Alex and I want to seriously take a stab at it after uh, this development project, yeah. and, and we've been in discussions with a couple other tech entrepreneurs down here. Cool. Um, so... Do you think 3D printing, 3D, the 3D printing of buildings will take off soon? How soon, if, if at all? Or, or do you think it's, we're still like, this is a pie-in-the-sky idea? No, I don't think it is. I, I think it's definitely going to happen. It, it is happening, right? We, we're starting to actually see it in China. And it's not necessarily like... So there's two different things going on, or maybe there's even more than that. But, but there's 3D printing, like what we've got now, which is, is FDM printing, where it's fused deposit material, mm-hmm. and it's building things up over time in a 3D printer, and then it is like a prefabricated piece that is then brought to the site and assembled. But then there's the actual like robotic 3D printing where it's driven by these robotic arms and it's it's spitting out concrete, right, level by level and building it up, which is still the FDM type um, method of building where it's layer by layer, but it's spitting out concrete and then it cures over time and, and then you've got these walls. So that's a site-built 3D mm-hmm. print, you know, air quotes. And then there's the kind where like SOM or they, you know, they have like these large, they're, they're taking advantage of these really large 3d printers, not desktop 3d printers, right? Huge ones in factories. And then they're taking those parts and assembling, but absolutely it's going to happen because it's way more controlled. It doesn't take labor to do it, right? You're, it's a machine doing it. So it's absolutely going to happen. And I don't know when, but I'm going to say it's a constant ramp, and mm-hmm. it's happening within the next 10 years. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my guess, too, is the next 10 years. Um, so the second spinoff to that is, okay, so then if, there's, if this is going to happen in the next 10 years, and I believe it is, and it sounds like everybody else does, too, uh, is that 
right now, 50% of architecture graduates don't actually ever get an architecture job, right? I mean, there's just yeah. always two, it's a two to one level. Um, and then beyond that, it's super competitive, right? We're just very competitive people. Like everybody wants to be the best architect, next rock star designer, all that kind of stuff. How much does the, and a part of this is also, you know, BIM now, you know, you use Arc, you use Archicad, you use, if you use Revit, right. You can do the work of maybe three or four people. Mm-hmm. One person can do the work of three or four people, and our template proves that all day long. Does that does does three D printing do the same thing? You know, does it affect architecture in the same kind of way? Where some people are saying, "Well, now you're going to be able to order an Amazon house, right?" You just go to right. Amazon. There's going to be an algorithm. You can say three bedrooms, two baths. Um, so it's going to like dehumanize the whole situation. And a lot of people are comfortable with that, right? At the end of the day, they're just like, "Well, I'm just a utilitarian." I don't really care about aesthetics and architecture. So is it going to be a struggle for architects? At this, like, is it going to be like this double-edged sword where, wow, it's great. Now we're architects can finally build buildings again. Master builder. Yeah. Yep. Be the master builder again versus, eh, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot too because we're just, the, the, they don't need us anymore. Do you have any, you know? It's the evolution of the practice. And that's a very Luddite type of thing, way of thinking, but I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, so it, it is, it's a continuation of the struggles that we have. It's not a new struggle. It's just a different struggle. I mean, we already struggle with getting someone to hire an architect versus buy a tract home, right? It's, it's, gonna be, it's the exact same struggle, but it's just another one. Because what you're trying to convince people is that architects understand space, and they understand how people live, and they want to design space for how people live which is very different from what maybe an algorithm thinks, right? And maybe what just any developer out there like KB Homes thinks. It's very different. Or a homeowner. They yeah. don't know that that plan is They don't, that even know. They don't know what they don't know, right? Exactly. <laughs> so so I don't I don't think it's a, it's going to be uh, I don't think we are shooting ourselves in the foot. It is the evolution of the practice. It is the way that things are going to be going and it doesn't mean it applies equally to everybody, right? But all architects. Um, but it is something that a lot of architects want to take this problem on, and they are taking this problem on. Same reason we have crazy big projects out there by Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid pushing the envelope of where design can go. It's not for all architects. Not all architects like it, agree with it, want to do it. But it is pushing the envelope of material science, algorithms, BIM, all these things. And that stuff does trickle its way back down. It's just like when Mercedes-Benz develops analog brakes way back when, and now every single car has it. Right, it's just something that does ripple through the whatever industry you're talking about. So in architecture, this will ripple through to all architects at some point. It's not like, you know, at some point there will be no more intermediate drafters, right? There will be everybody does BIM. Everybody, you can't not do BIM at some point. But when does that happen? It's it's still quite a long ways off. Yeah. Are you familiar with a program called TestFit? Yeah. Testfit.io. Yeah, I, that. Di- so just a shout out to them. I've played around and, and talked to one of the guys. But in case people don't know what it is, if you're doing residential uh, buildings and, and condos. so Right. Think, it's for multifamily housing mostly, right? It's aimed at those kind of yep, projects. Yep. Yep. So above 25 units, probably 50 mm-hmm. to 100. And what you can do is you can put in the, the different unit sizes, mm-hmm. the parking requirements. So how many parking per unit. And then basically you can give a breakdown if you want so many two bedrooms or one bedrooms or three bedrooms or whatever and it and you can use kind of a scale adjustment to to change it and it will give you all these different arrangements and it will kind of pack out your site because a lot of it is getting the most for your return on the land so you can put in the setbacks and all that stuff yeah but you can see how something like that which is very useful in, in the beginning yep um, it's a jump off point right yep. yep can then be used or trickle down into the other program bim revit you know everything Absolutely. else where how rooms fit. And he's even shown how you can go from that colored diagram that test fit spits out and it will automatically build all the walls for you in Revit. So you have this, again, just a great starting point. And one thing that is really neat about that is there is some user intervention, right? That you draw the outline of the building you need, you provide all the program, but then it's figuring out ideal stair locations, elevator locations, corridor lengths, no dead end corridors, fire rated walls, where they need to be. So Again, it, it takes away a lot of the stuff that we have, the mundane stuff that architects have to deal with so that we can spend more time designing. We always want more time to design. Yep. It makes for a better project. Everything you just listed out there, 
would take me two to three hours to do one thing. Yeah. And then I have to do, oh, that might not work. What if I switch the L of the floor plan so it works over here? Right. Now another two to three hours for right. me to figure that out. And, and, and by the end, you've got one or two or three concepts, right? And then in 30 seconds, that thing will spit out 500 concepts. And it's like, okay, now what can I do with this? 400 of these are crap. 50 of them, okay, I don't like and then you, you whittle it down to three really great starting points. Again, it did it in 30 seconds, right? So that's really the power of where the stuff is headed. It's going to allow us to take our projects further. That's really how I see it. Yeah. Fair enough. The, the other thing, so, you know, I, I, I agree with uh, this is just in a continuation of the, of the struggle. And as long as we're recognizing that mm -hmm. and, you know, going attacking it head on. Right. Trying to solve it, like I think that's trying part of it is it. actually being like the Elon Musk. Well, of and trying to and trying to own it, you know. Yeah. I think that's where that's where on, th on this side of the table where we yeah. really want to do it is, and that's what we're doing as a you know architect as, as developer, a developer is. Yeah. God, if you can just stay in control, right. I mean, at the end of the, at the end of the day, we're still not there with the numbers. I'm still whittling these numbers down, but but all of a sudden because we're wearing three hats, we can make sure that the the design intent is there like it's not going to be destroyed by maybe some, you can lose a little in this bucket and you can gain it in this bucket because you own all three buckets like that kind of a thing right right yeah. and then maybe you can also get these projects to you can still do the very difficult projects that the developer especially on an infill site he might say he or she might say, oh, the numbers just don't work. Well, maybe that's because you're only wearing two of the hats or one of the hats. We have a much more flexibility and they don't know more what they control. Don't know, right? Yeah. So you, because you're an architect, you have that number one project experience. But then just the creativity, the things you've been trained to do, right? That place where architects add a lot of value is coming up with unconventional solutions. Yeah. And developers don't think like that. They want the fastest, simplest. If, if you can do it in the first scheme, even better, right? And if it's good enough. I mean, that's typically the, the way yeah, that they sure. think. And so, again, I think that this all leads back to where we started when you asked me what I, what I do, is the people who are taking on these problems are designing their future, right? We are taking it head on. We are ta trying to tackle this stuff so that we can be in control when we get there because chances are you're not going to be happy when you get there if you've been waiting around for someone else to tell you what you're going to be doing which I think a lot of architects do. They kind of sit back and they watch and they're really hesitant and they, they're, they're not risky at all. They want to be really safe. And so when the recession hits, they're scrambling, they're reacting, right? Where the other ones who are designing their future have already thought about that and they know where they, what they can do and where they're pushing. Like when you guys, when the recession hit and you guys decided to go off and start building stuff, when you guys started this firm, you started it out of the dining room, right? And you started... You were designing your future at that point. And now you guys are what I would consider really successful. I mean, this is definitely the mindset of what we call the intrinsically motivated people, right? Yeah. People who are just motivated to do things instead of just sit and wait and watch. Yeah. yeah. Mark likes to t say that we, we take permission. We don't ask for permission. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I, I, like I was that. like, oh, I like it too. Yeah. <laughs> Mark from our firm? Mark LePage. Mark LePage. Oh, uh, there. Um, what would you recommend to I, – I was going to say – students but i think this could apply to anyone where to start looking for the future because a lot of people are sitting there and they know autocad or revit or archicad and they're doing whatever they're doing yep. in all those industries and they might have some free time or might want to just look in some areas what would you say okay the future is trending towards this way maybe start looking at this program this extension or thinking what what would you so i just went to a conference at USC about a week ago, and it was uh, called the BIMBOP, and they do it every year. And basically, they bring in speakers, and it's kind of like your dream list of people who are technologists in architecture. So it's really focused on anything that's really high-level BIM. or So there's, there's speakers from Morphosis. There's speakers there from HOK. There's guys there like Ian Keogh who developed Dynamo for Revit, and now he's off doing his own thing called Hypar. Um, there's people doing crazy stuff with point clouds and, you know, where they're going out and capturing existing conditions and bringing them in so that they can build on top of them. So if you're really looking for, again, the, the, ind the profession of architecture, you could do anything. There are so many avenues that you could take. But if you really want to look at where the future is going, look at conferences like those because they're talking about, like, Hypar, for, in for instance. Um, Ian Keel left Autodesk last year, started this company. It's, uh, it's built. The idea is that 
architecture as open source where we all contribute to the profession where if you're starting a hospital project you want to not start with a blank page he, he showed this slide and it was in his powerpoint and it was a white slide with four little elevation markers right we've all seen that anybody who's opened up revit for the first time mm -hmm. that's the first view you come to and it's like why does it have to be like that so if he's taking the stance of open source software, when you want to start something new, you build on the work of others. So somebody else has already provided the database that you could build your thing on top of, and they've already provided the content management system, which you could build on top of. You go, you know WordPress, you know Squarespace, all these websites, right? You don't start from scratch. You start with all of the infrastructure in place already. So if you wanted to start a hospital project, you would tell the program, I'm starting a hospital project. And it would say, how many beds? How many ORs? And, and based on other architects' input, because lots of architects do hospitals, right, they would provide you with building blocks to do this. And then it, you would take something like TestFit, and you would start putting those building blocks into your specific scenario. So you're not starting from scratch. You're starting building on the expertise of our profession as if we're all in it together. And his idea to make that actually work is that the people who provide that, those kinds of building blocks get paid to provide them whenever you start a new project. So you're going to say, run on this new project, and it's going to run somebody else's algorithm, and they get paid for it. And in the app economy that we live in, right, iPhone apps, 99 cents, whatever, mm -hmm. you might get paid 99 cents or 20 bucks or whatever it is, but whatever it is, it's way cheaper than doing it yourself. Yeah. And so it's a, it's kind of a, I don't want to say communist, but it's like everybody contributes, <laughs> right? Like everybody contributes. Capitalist and, communist. And so. It's still voluntary, so it's not. It is, it is. So, so, but, but it's like the community. It, it's, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. is that we are a community. And, and I think a lot of times architects are so concerned about intellectual property and secrecy yeah. and not showing your cards. This is a flip, and this is, this, is a, this is a different way to look at it, and I, it's really exciting because if you're going to start doing a multifamily project, you want to build on the shoulders of somebody who's done 30 of them. Why wouldn't do, you? Do you think that thinking, that kind of thinking of we're so worried about our, and our IP, our intellectual property, or just mm -hmm. the profession itself is because, is because you have this two-to-one ratio that I brought up earlier, is that we have so many people that want to be architects, and there's so little, there's so many, so many little availability of it that this is our react this is kind of like our knee jerk reaction it really should be more well thought out and the and I, my my opinion of it is, is that i think the market needs to let itself shake out in that like mm -hmm. there's really only so many architect jobs necessary i, well, I mean I, well there's plenty of work for everybody i think that's the first thing is that we should all recognize that there is plenty of work right. to go around we are bred in a competitive environment that doesn't help, right? You go through school. Oh, exactly. And it's all competition. Especially if it's one like ours where, I don't know if you guys had like a prize at the end of the whole thing. Yeah, you know, yeah number yeah, one. Type. There's awards. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it's so, so you're bred in that kind of environment. And so when it comes to sharing ideas, think back to when you were in school and you were sitting in studio and people freely shared ideas. I think it was, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm of two minds here. Like number one, we're bred in a competitive, uh, secretive kind of like these are my ideas they're the best ideas i want to develop these ideas myself i want to be the sole author of my ideas versus when you're sitting in studio and it's late at night and people are like that looks amazing what are you working on and people oh here here's what i'm working on this tell me tell me what you think i need a set of fresh eyes on this and that's a very open like just sharing of information I, to me it's it's ludicrous that we hold on so tightly to the stuff i've actually been in meetings in different architecture offices where people say like why don't you offer free training to your people why don't you offer revit training let's just say well because they might take that information and go somewhere else okay that's ridiculous right right because you or they might feel confident in their job and love that you provided training so that they can actually do what they want to do since <laughs> they were 12 well there's that and, and let's just say let's just say they do take it somewhere else great it made the profession better it's not all about me but you've also probably heard the quote where it's like you you train somebody to do great work and they'll do great work or you can not train them and they'll stay right like they could leave and do great stuff or you could they could not learn stuff and they can stay and it's like do you want to create that really comfortable environment where people don't know their tools and they really aren't providing a great value to your firm, to the bottom line? No. So it's a ridiculous attitude. And I think a lot of times architects get stuck in that because they're so worried about 
how everybody else perceives them, and and th- there's so many things going on there psychologically that it's it's issues. And I kind of want to iterate from experience that some people might say, "Oh, that's theory. That's great," but. I live in the real world or, or whatever, but mm-hmm. we've actually done that in our firm. And the biggest example is that when we built up our template and all of our files that, and all of our examples that we did, we went, um, we were trying to hire, we went to see you. They asked us if we could teach. And then our first thought was, well, let's give all the students, all this stuff, mm-hmm. all the stuff that they'd have to wait the four blocks. years with. Right. Exactly. Yep. And when giving them a head start. Yep. We were teaching in the engineering department, and when the architecture, we asked them to come and critique. These are freshman engineering students. Some of it's their you know, first semester. They go, we want them in our third year architecture studio. Because, again, when you give them those starting blocks, and what you started off talking about, we've done this in a, in a, in a dumbed-down way. And I was just on a webinar with Mark LePage mm-hmm. and telling you know, how to make Revit efficient and all that stuff. And we don't have that program that you talked about, but what we have is a a file structure system so that when you're starting, basically we tell people, okay, you can, yep, go to the standards and and obviously start from the template, but um, let's say you're doing a multifamily. Mm -hmm. Okay, go to the multifamily. We have best projects right there. So you can look at that. Let's say you're doing it in Lakewood. Okay, now go to the Lakewood project and you can see the Lakewood standards that they like too. So now you're starting and, and take some time, look over those projects and then we can even talk like, okay, what was the hiccups? What went, went wrong? You don't yeah. know. Lessons learned. Lessons sure. learned. Sure. But start, start you know, yeah. it, just because it you're creative you head start. Yep. doesn't mean you can't stand on the shoulders of giants exactly. or at least little giants that yep. have done, <laughs> <laughs> done things. Um, do you have, have, have you yeah. guys heard of uh, Laney LA? It's a, it's a small firm in LA and Anthony Laney is, he's on Instagram. He does fantastic, uh, Instagram posts. Uh, you should definitely check him out. But what he, I remember him saying something about how small firm, you know, eight or nine people like you guys and said, we train everybody assuming they're going to leave and either start their own firm or go, so, or go work somewhere else and get different experience. And I thought that was interesting, right? Because most people want to train people so that they'll stay and provide more value to them. But I think it was just an interesting take. He, 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 he wants to breed architects who are really good at what they do. So he puts everything he can into them. And so it sounds like what you guys are doing with the students, and I know that you do stuff here with your guys with the templates, and you're constantly re- revamping them and adding, making them better, having people give their input on what could make them better. And I think that giving people ownership over that kind of thing within the firm, even if they do go somewhere else someday, like it happens, right? This is architecture. People go all over the place. They want different kinds of experiences or they want to get somewhere closer to home or they want to do something bigger. Like assume that's going to happen and don't look at that as a negative, right? But yeah. let them make our profession better by what we can pour into them now. I think that's a great way to go. You, you can't control the uncontrollable because those are reasons for people to live, uh, to leave. You can control though negative reasons why why they might leave they're not getting the training they're not getting the responsibility they're not growing fast enough Mm -hmm. they're not getting the ownership so that's that's from a leadership perspective you know your firm our firm okay how do we then make the opportunity here right so that they have a choice rather than forcing them out because all we're doing is the bare minimum stuff like that um did you have anything or else i have a next segment okay uh are no, no, Nick reads. So, you know Nick reads. He's going to read, and then we'll say something about Nick. Love you, Nick. <laughs> Hello, best friends. I hope you had a great week this week. A reading. In the end, a company needs to invoke the most fundamental base of action, the attitudes and behavior of its people deep in the organization. You must create a culture of trust and commitment that motivates people to execute the agreed strategy. Not to the letter, but to the spirit. People's minds and hearts must align with the new strategy. So that at the level of the individual, people embrace it of their own accord and willingly go beyond compulsory execution to voluntary cooperation in carrying it out. Blue Ocean Strategy by W. Chan Kim and Renee. 
Lance. Awesome Archicad presentation yesterday on the Entree Architect Facebook page. Alexa, play Jump Around. Toodles! That's so good. <laughs> great, great Archicad presentation there, there yeah, Lance. <laughs> that Lance did, not Alex on Revit. Right. Um, <laughs> so it's funny because, again, it fits in. Yep. Like I, clockwork. I think it ties into exactly your, you know, what are you doing? Well, you're telling people to take control of your own future because it said you need to have buy-in. Yeah. And the way to get buy-in is to involve everyone. Yep. I, I, I can give you guys a couple examples of something that I'm personally like just, this is something I really believe in is providing an avenue for people who are passionate about technology to live in the firm that I work in. Because I think for the longest time, people who are really passionate about it, either those, those skills were not needed, were not thought of as valuable. Um, and so a lot of people left because they couldn't find a place to land. And th- not only that, but if people are looking for job opportunities in a place where, where you offer employment, they're looking for particular things that they want to grow in. If you don't offer those things, they will not even apply. And if you want to attract the best talent, then you need to have either job descriptions that support those things or you need to say in your vision or your mission that these are things that we believe in so that they know that you care about those things. Otherwise, what's the point? I'm going to go somewhere that, that does that stuff. So if you don't offer it, they don't have a place to land, and even if they are there and they have those passions, they're not going to stay. So you've got to give a, those people an outlet. You've got to support them at all these different levels, just like Nick just said in the quote. I mean, you've got to provide support for everybody to add value to the firm in their way. And so find you, what does that require as leaders? It requires us to know our people mm-hmm. and know what they want to do, know when they want to do it, see the experiences that they want to gain, and then provide opportunities for that to happen, whether that's on the next project, whether it's on the existing project. Maybe they want to become a project manager, and they're working as a drafter right now. So we have to find places for them to learn management. We can't just say, okay, in three years you'll be there based on experience. It doesn't work like that. And not only that, people don't want these kind of speed limits. When, we, when I was in school, there was no YouTube, but now there is, right? Where do people learn computational design? On YouTube. I mean, they don't learn it in school. There's no time to teach it in school, right? We're still teaching them how to think. We're teaching them how to solve problems. So if people are interested in that stuff, they just go find it. And so they can learn without a speed limit. So if we can do the same thing in our firms, even better. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, did, Nick, didn't you already play? Didn't you already ask Alexa to play Jump Around? <laughs> He's, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> I'm still one of your friends. Um, <laughs> So I, I agree uh, with everything Evan said. Um, next, we're, we're going to grow our firm and grow other people that are studying for the ARE with ARE Jeopardy. And uh, Evan, you wrote, can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book and, and who you think it's helpful for? Yeah, so I wrote ARE Hacks, and it's a paperback book, or you can get it as a Kindle download. And uh, basically, I wrote it to give people... Um, basically a leg up on what it takes to conquer the ARE. So it's not a study guide. It's not uh, anything that's going to give you the best tips for passing any particular section of an exam. It is a life strategy so that you can pass those tests because it takes a huge commitment. It takes a huge chunk of your time. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I've got four kids. I got a full-time job. I got my license in 2014, so four years ago. I waited 17 years to get that exam, right? And I, I think that's important to say because yep. that's going to make a joke. Oh, and you're only 25. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, there, life does come in the way. And, I, and I, hate to cut you, I hate to cut you off, but that was a major shift is when I redesigned my life yep. for the test. And, and I, that's what you have to do. Yeah. And that is exactly what the book helps you do. And it gives you all kinds of tips and strategies on how to do that and how I did that. So number one, it's going to give you some a leg up, but it's also going to give you real life examples of what worked for me. And I'm not everybody. It's not, not for everybody. But I think if, if you have, if, if any one of those things that we just mentioned kind of punch you in the gut, then I think that book's for you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's bring in the guys. All right, here we go. We're just going to get right into the first question. 
Evan, you don't need to answer, but you can shake your head if you knew the answer. Yes or no. Afterwards. I'll be thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this one isn't necessarily ARE, but I feel like it's uh, helpful to our firm and other firms. Uh, where would you find driveway and parkings? Uh, well, actually, here, I'm going to. Yeah. Where would you find driveway and parking stall widths if you're looking for it? A, in the jurisdiction municipal code. B, in the zoning code. C, in the adopted I-series code. So that's your IBC, IRC, IFC, all that. Or D, in the state statutes. So you're looking, hey, I have a parking situation at 90 degrees. Uh, how big are those stalls? How big is the driveway? All that. Where are you looking? A, jurisdiction municipal code. So that would be like the Boulder Municipal Code, the Longmont, Denver. Uh, B, the zoning code. C, the I-series codes. IRC, IBC, or D, the state statutes. What do we got, guys? C, 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 B. <laughs> the answer is A. <laughs> the answer is A. Uh, did, did, where, is that what you were thinking, Evan? It is, but I, I just know the barking wits for everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> or Evan's brain. Yeah. Just tap it. Pretty soon, he's developing technology. You can just tap into his brain. Yeah. It'll be part of a shared communist <laughs> structure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, that, that's where you'll find it. Um, uh, and, and basically, if you type in your city and then muni codes, it'll pop up. And that's where they have everything from like how their city councils run to... Uh, you know, what they want for all these standards, for setbacks, for open space, all that. Okay, number two. <clears throat> what is the stair head, cl head clearance in a commercial structure? So you're going up the stairs. What's that, your head height clearance? Is it A, seven feet? B, seven foot six? C, eight foot? D, six foot eight? Doot, doot. I'm good at making beeps. Are you guys ready? Hit it. D A eight foot. <laughs> so Evan Evan says C. No, I don't say C. I'm oh, oh, he's reading. So reading his. Six foot eight D. Yep. Yep. It is, and the reason I know this is because I was walking away from one a commercial structure, and we had six foot eight, and I thought it would be higher, and I called Lance. I said, "What is it?" And he looked it up, and it was six foot eight. So. Um, and usually we use seven foot doors, yeah. which is yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Do you, because you're more commercial, and if yep. you don't know this, this is fine. Do you normally do higher than six foot eight in commercial nope. structures? Not if you don't have to, because every all, height costs money. Right. Yes. Period. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Here's Lance. Oh. This tricky, tricky. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm the tricky one. Number three. What? What is permanence or resistance to deterioration known as A, durability, B, rot resistance, C, maintenance-free materials, C, D, solidness? What is permanence or resistance to deterioration known as A, durability, B, rot resistance, C, maintenance-free materials, D, solidness? Yeah, I know. It's weird. That's why I ask these kind of questions. All right, what do we got? A, C, A. Question, or the answer is A, durability. Whoop, whoop. I'll be sound effects. There you go. Solid. What's the count we have? Solidability. Solidability, exactly. <laughs> so, Mark and Mark Mark the lead. Wow, redemption. That's because Gresh isn't here. Number four. <laughs> The ease with which concrete can be placed and consolidated in the forms is known as A, slump, B, workability, D, plasticity, D, usability. C was plasticity. Yep. Uh, no, uh, one more time. The ease with which concrete can be placed and consolidated in the forms is known as A, slump, B, workability, C, plasticity, D, usability. What do we got? We got A, A, and B. The correct answer is B. We have a tie. The Ooh. E, the e, it's the ease of the worker. Exactly. Not the ease of the concrete. Yep, yep. So slump, slump's a real thing, right? Uh, when you have like a slump test, because you have to, you have to, yeah, exactly, you do a little cone. And then plasticity is a real thing with concrete, right? And then usability is just me making stuff up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here's the overtime question. Ready? 
What is a member beneath a door to over the over the floor joint or provide weather protection known as besides a threshold? Okay? Let me say that one more time. <laughs> what is a member beneath a door over the floor joint or one that provides weather protection known as besides a threshold? Okay? What is that member known as? It's besides a threshold. It's another name. Ready? A, seam cover. B, cover. C, saddle. D, trim seam. I would be guessing on this one. Yeah, yeah this is a, this no is, clue. This no is an clue. OT. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the, the, just, the, just the answers? Okay, all the answers. Okay, it's A, a seam cover. B, cover. C, saddle. D, trim seam. This is the tiebreaker. Probably a bad tiebreaker. One more time. A, seam cover. B, cover. C, saddle. D, trim seam. <laughs> All right. Show them. C, C, C. C. C is the answer. Whoa. A double tiebreaker. I think they're just going to have the paper, rock, scissors to win. Paper, unless Evan has something. Unless Evan has an on-the-fly nope. one. No. Okay. No. Nope. All right. <laughs> Two or three times. All right, we'll do a tie. Okay. It's the first ever tie. Can we have one where it's the closest distance? <laughs> to what? <laughs> no, 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 to, to the, like a, a setback, uh, a height, and they just have to guess a number. Like a, like a standard, like six foot eight. So if there's any standards that pop in your head, maybe. Um, what? All right, I've got one. So it's parking related. Again. Okay, good. All right, so parking stall standard width is nine feet. Okay, everybody knows this. No, this is compact. All right. So now, if you talk about length, all right. So if you if you're laying out a parking lot, and you've got head to head parking, right, with no uh, landscape in the middle, just parking blocks. How long is the parking stall from the back of the paint stripes to the parking block? And then if they get this right, do you know like okay that six? No, I don't know that. Because okay. <laughs> any angle could be <laughs> could be what they are. Yeah. So so you've got you've got a parking lot, all right, and you've got cars parking front to front, head to head, all right. So you've just got parking blocks, no landscape in the middle, all right. How long is your parking stall from the parking block to the back of it, basically the end of the stripes? Mm, that's interesting. Just one, not both of them. Yeah, just one. Okay. What do we got? 18. 18, 20. All right, so you've got to have 18 feet, all right, from the back to the parking block, and you need two feet of overhang. So correct is? 20. 20! <laughs> Poor Mark. But that's the overhang. would be 18, so it would be 19, is your average length? No. You've got to have, you've got to have that 40 total, right? There you go. Okay, let's. We can wrap it up while everyone's here. Um, just a couple of shout outs. Uh, um, testfit.io, just because we mentioned it. Yep. Uh, Evan's book, you can get it. ARE Hacks, you can find it on Amazon. Yep. Um, all that Revit stuff that we talked about, Revit Rocket Ship, go there, revitrocketship.com, you can get that. And then, Lance? Uh, if you have a favorite episode, please share it with a colleague, please share it with a friend, share it with your mom, and uh, thanks for listening. Thanks.